want to welcome all of you here. I'm Jan Barris with the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and am delighted to be today's moderator because I've known the speaker for a very Forty. long time. <laughs> Forty some odd years. And you know that by the fact that I call her Shelley, which is what she used to go by those days, and then she's now, as befits an author, uh, Michelle. Um, and actually, Shelley reminded me that I helped get her her first or one of her first jobs. So I'm right. delighted about that. And I've also been delighted over the years to see the wonderful work that she's done in a variety of areas. You have her bio in front of you, so I won't go over it. Um, she's done some really interesting things, almost all of them focused on the arts and the arts in Asia. And that inevitably has led to this terrific book, which we highly recommend to all of you. It's, it's a beautiful book, both in terms of the content and in terms of the quality of the book. Visually, it's beautiful. Even just turning the pages is a pleasure <laughs> because tactically, the, the, the paper that she and her publisher or whoever designer chose, um, it's just a lovely feel and, and look to the book. Um, we just did a short, a brief podcast, which will be available, as will this video and a long podcast of the entire program. So if you have friends who haven't been able to get here today, um, please urge them to watch the video or listen to the long podcast. And in addition to welcoming Shelley, I'm delighted to welcome some other old friends here. First of all, her husband, Leslie Lowe, who I haven't seen for many years, and another old friend from Hong Kong, um, Mark Selden, who does very interesting things in Hong Kong, and Frida Wong from Shanghai. So we have a very international group here, as well as many friends from the New York area. So thank you all for coming. Shelley's going to talk for about 20 minutes, and then we'll have Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen. I'm very happy to be back at the uh, National Committee. After 40 years, I have not collaborated with them for 40 years. The last time, I was given a job as an intern in 1978 for the, national, the Chinese national basketball team. <laughs> I, I think I was chosen for my height. Because I, don't, <laughs> I, I don't remember being helpful in any other way. She was the rebound for the balls. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm particularly happy this evening to see some gentlemen in the crowd, because when you're writing a book on Chinese women in the arts, or I've, I've discovered women anywhere, that you get a little bit of a start from people, which I really never expected that. But in the United States, I have kind of gotten that response. So I think the gentleman, you might like to know right away that this book, I did not start out writing a book about women. And I hope I'll tell you how the whole thing came along. I'm very happy that I decided to do so, but it was not the original idea. And it came because out of a need that I discovered. Uh, I should explain that actually the book goes back to my own career at the Asian Cultural Council, which I think everyone knows is not the Asian Society, but it's uh, the Asian Cultural Council is a foundation based in New York, which gives grants to individual artists in the visual and performing arts from Asia. And these artists come to the United States on programs which are individually tailored for them. So I worked at the ACC in Hong Kong for 25 years. And during this time, I had the opportunity to meet the most outstanding, extraordinary, gifted artists, I could say, in Asia today. So when I was ready to retire, I, I felt that there was one thing that uh, had, I felt that I still had work to do. Because one of my disappointments was that all of these wonderful artists who I got to know were still not known in the United States. Although they were the leading artists at home, they were still not known in the art circles here, with the exception of the very, very big names. So I thought that I could understand some of the problems. One is language does make it more difficult. Some of the information is not accessible. But it seemed to me that this is something that uh, needed to be worked on. So I decided to um, work on a publication about some of the artists that I had known who are leading artists. And one thing I did want to focus on, I, I was thinking of men and women at the time, what I did want to focus on was the areas, uh, my own areas of expertise and experience. So I had lived, um, so, so what I'm really writing on, in the United States you call Greater China, is what you call the area. In, in China they actually call this now 
uh, two coasts, four places. It's actually an expression. Di <laughs> is actually the politically correct term that is used to express this area. So I felt very comfortable in, in working with artists in that area. I lived in, in uh, Hong Kong for 25 years, which means you go frequently to Macau to eat. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and I knew artists in Macau as well. Uh, I had lived in Taiwan in the, um, uh, in the 1970s. I lived for two years. And uh, I started going to China in 1978 as a tour guide. And that was another job that Jan Barris got for me, <laughs> the Papagapados brothers. And so I started going to, uh, to China in 1978. So, and of course, I've been traveling there all the past 40 years. So um, I wanted to work on this area because I have a deep affection for this area. And I think um, I've noticed that it's not, uh, it's an area which is often seen as one big lump of Chinese people. And I wanted to work on the cultural complexity, the differences of these places, their history, language, and cultural differences. And so I thought this would be uh, an interesting way to do it because artists are the people who are working from their culture and from their personal lives, but also from the culture that nurtured them. So that's where I started. So I began to, I put together my, my group of people who I was trying to, uh, of course, the four places, I wanted to cover as many art fields as possible and as long a period of history uh, from, from early times to recent um, of living people. So I started interviewing people and doing a lot of research and I worked for actually for the first year, 2012, I started working on this. But in the process, I discovered that the men, and these are, I was picking, of course, the best well, the most known and the famous ones, that there was a lot of information available on them already. That uh, on the internet and in publications, they'd already been covered in English, that it was available. Uh, the women, on the other hand, were not out there. And the women were of equal caliber in the arts, but they had not reached an international audience in English. Now, I didn't read everything available in Chinese, but they were not on Wikipedia, they were not out there at all. So this is a discrepancy which I noticed right away. And, you, and any writer wants to write about something that hasn't been covered. Um, secondly, in, in interviewing the women, um, I have to say it was a lot more fun. It was, really <laughs> <laughs> it was really great. And I think it's because women like to talk to women, right? We like to talk. And um, so it was a very relaxed, open experience. And they would tell me anything. And it was just wonderful. I mean, I had to, they told me things I could never write. I was like, no. <laughs> but I think for them, and also not being recognized, this was important too, that this was really a special experience. So that was a lot more fun. And we were beginning to have a real sense of, solidarity. But the turning point um, happened in 2013 uh, when I saw a documentary about the writer Nia Hua Ling. Now Nia Hua Ling I had wanted to include from the beginning of my project. She had been the first Chinese women to receive funding from the Asian Cultural Council in 1964. And um, she's also the most prominent actually. She's a very prominent writer in China. So just by luck it turned out that year that um, Anne Chi Chen, fil a filmmaker, made a documentary about her. And I, I have two friends from Wuhan, I bet you've seen it. It's a great film, <laughs> if you want to look at it later, everyone should see this film about Nia Ling. So I'll say, should I pass it around? I don't know if you can get it on Amazon. But it's about the history of the time, and I was just so impressed by how courageous this woman was in fighting all obstacles to become a leading writer at the, during the most diff the tumultuous time in Chinese modern history. And to establish the international writing program in the United States and Iowa. So I was so impressed by her, and I was so unimpressed by myself that I didn't really know anything about her, and that she was a very prominent figure, and I'm in the field of the arts, so I realized something's wrong here. We're not finding out about people. So from that moment, I decided to write about women, and I was so happy that I did it. The women were so excited that we were writing about women. I was afraid they would say, you know, we don't want to be ghettoized into women's uh, book, and I'm not a woman artist, I'm an artist. No one said that. They were so happy that it was a book about women, that women were being promoted. So it became, there was a great sense of solidarity, and it was a very joyful product, uh, a whole uh, process. And the process of talking back and forth was almost more important than the book, actually because this, it was a very deep process of listening and listening and writing and then checking and they say no, 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 and then back and forth. And to understand someone at that level is really quite rare. So it was, it was a very beautiful process. Um, so this evening, what I would like to do, uh, it's not possible to um, tell you about all of the people, but I'd like to, to introduce someone from each of the areas, at least, and just talk about 
uh, a few artworks because all of the stories are very personal and there's a lot of context about history. So Niang Ma Ling, um, we'll just speak about her briefly. What I would like to do is just give you some dots about the person, not go into their personal lives. It's all in the book in, in great detail because they told me everything. And um, so, but what I would like to talk about is their artwork. And so giving, I'm gonna give you dots that are not connected, but I still think it's, I'm sort of pulling out pieces that I think are extremely important. And we are talking about artists. So Niang Ling, born in Wuhan in 1925, uh, the year that uh, Sun Yat-sen died. Niang Hua Ling is just an extraordinary person. She is first and foremost a writer. She has published 22 books of fiction. And uh, however, she's probably better known as the woman who established the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa. And the reason for that is that most of her literature has not been translated into English. She is now 92 years old. She has lived in the United States for 50 years. That's longer than I've lived here. And so her story, I feel, is just as much an American story as it is a Chinese story. And it made me think about how, how one's uh, past history before coming to America is sort of part of our history as well. Um, so she, she was inducted into the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame. And she's a very, very prominent person. But uh, she, people don't know about her very well outside of Iowa. So I would like to talk about um, first is her major work, that, or at least her best known work. So Mulberry and Peach is a novel which she published in 1970. She wrote it in the United States after she came. And uh, it wasn't translated for 10 years or so, uh, even more, 15 years, and it won, won the American Book Award. So um, I'd like to talk about this novel also as a way in talking about her life because although it is not autobiographical, it follows the sequence of her life very closely, but then uh, the characters are not representatives of herself. Mulberry and Peach um, are, it's one woman who has a split personality. And Mulberry represents the traditional Chinese woman who follows the Confucian values and obeys her husband. And uh, Peach is the Chinese woman who went to America and becomes a loud mouth crass person <laughs> <laughs> during the period of the sexual revolution of the 60s. And she's just wild and promiscuous. And, um, but it's very sad because she's trying to fit in. And so what the book is really about is cultural dislocation of the era which is known by many writers as the exile. The era of 1949 after 1949, when the Chinese went all around the world. Two million people went to Taiwan. So it's, uh, and, and the suffering as a result of that, and the loss of identity, that affects people for a very long time. And, but it's written as fiction, and um, it's, very, uh, it's a very modern novel, because some of the language is really hard to read. Uh, Peach is more of a, of a clinically schizophrenic person, and the language is like that as well, very jittery. And, um, and it's a very disturbing novel in which she presents, uh, not very, I can't remember one nice person in the book. <laughs> so it's really, it's hard to read because it's disturbing. But what's important is that it follows, Mulberry follows uh, the sequence of her own life. She lives, through, um, she lives through the Japanese occupation of China and then goes to Chongqing. And then after the war, World War II, you have the Civil War and then flees to Taiwan where she has to suffer the white terror error in, in, of the Guomindang in Taiwan. And then eventually, and, um, and she herself is persecuted, and eventually she flees to the United States during the Vietnam War. And so it takes place during all these historical true events. And uh, we learn about a woman who is trying to decide what she wants to be in this modern world and uh, constantly arguing back and forth the two personalities from a different cultural perspective. So it's just a fascinating book, which um, at the time it came out, it was banned in Taiwan. Uh, in those days, many, fic many novels appeared in newspapers in, um, what do we say, it's still episodes, uh, like excerpts, at, and so people would read every day another episode from the book. And that was a very important place for people to, to publicize new fiction. So after three chapters, it was, it was banned in Taiwan as subversive and, um, and pornographic. And so um, the reason for this was, um, where should I begin? There is a, a section, section three, yeah. in which she describes Mulberry, who, who goes to Taiwan in 1949 with her husband. 
and a child, this is fiction, and they live in an attic, which is about this high, and they just live there, and, and they have to, they're in hiding. So they live in this attic, and um, they, they can only crawl around, and the daughter, they have three tatami, the daughter who could stand up imitates the parents and crawls around too and becomes a crawling person because of the environment. So this was seen as a thinly veiled uh, description of the persecution of uh, intellectuals during the white terror in Taiwan. And so it was immediately banned. Fortunately, Hong Kong, which um, until recently was an extremely open place, which had publications representing um, every possible uh, persuasion. So you had uh, you had communist, leftist, you had leftist publications. You had um, uh, you had Guomindang publications, and the government didn't mess with this as long as you didn't criticize the colonial government. So at this time, uh, a Hong Kong publisher published that for her. So um, I think uh, the most important thing to to present here is the kind of suffering that uh, Niang Hualing did go through when she moved with her family and fled to Taiwan. Um, let's see. Yeah, she moved with her husband, and they went to Taiwan, um, and it was a very big adjustment if you know what was happening in Taiwan at that time. They were not welcomed by the Taiwan people who did not speak Mandarin. They spoke Japanese and Taiwanese. Uh, so at that time, her husband couldn't find work, and he went to Japan. So uh, would commute back and forth, and so they were separated most of the time. Uh, and they had two <coughs> children, but the, the marriage was falling apart. And so it was, it was a difficult time. But she found a fabulous job as literary editor of a publication called the Free China Journal. If you can see, Zi Yuzhongwu was the name of the of the journal, and Lei Zhen was an intellectual who was a, a party member of the Nationalist Party, and uh, he had the endorsement of the Nationalist government to uh, to publish this journal, which was a journal of social commentary, political commentary, and Niao Haoling, as a literary editor, was able to find to publish the works of very interesting. Uh, authors at a time when there was very extreme censorship, when people were just, if they wanted to publish, they would write anti-communist stories or they would write about um, sentimental romance, nothing, no complaining. So uh, she had played an important role at that time in, in introducing people like Bo Yang, who later wrote um, The Ugly Chinaman, and so she had a very, uh, actually a very powerful role. So what happened here was, um, uh, Lei Zhen, over, over the years, he, he established this in 1949. And then over time, as things changed in the, in the government in Taiwan, he began criticizing different things that were happening. And in 1960, the publication was closed down. And he was arrested, along with three other colleagues, and put in jail for 10 years. And uh, Niao Hua Ling was not arrested, but she was terrified, and she went into a kind of self-designated house arrest. She went home, she never went out. She wouldn't contact anyone because she was so afraid of being arrested. So this was the era through which she lived, which we see then um, back in, um, in Mulberry and Peach when she talks about the kind of fear and hiding that the intellectuals had to suffer uh, during that period. So this is the first part of her life. Um, so she was living during a, di a difficult time of, of hiding and decided, you know, she was taking care of two, two children and uh, trying to make ends meet. She lost her job, and then her mother died, and it was a very bad time. And then the next, the next part of her life begins, and she meets Paul Engel, who came to Taiwan. He, she's invited to a cocktail party by the American consulate. He is a poet, an American poet, and um, he is the director of the Writers' Workshop at the University of Iowa, which was a very famous workshop that uh, people like John Irving and Raymond Carver, very important workshop. So he had gotten a grant from the Asian Cultural Council to invite the first 12 Asians. And so he was looking around who he wanted to invite, and uh, she was recommended by the consulate, and she was a very important writer, because during this time she'd been writing short stories. So she uh, had personal reasons for not going. She decided, I gotta get out of here, and so she left and went to Iowa and took part in that uh, writer's workshop and decided to stay. Uh, Iowa, which I didn't know myself, is a very important city for literature in the United States. And so she loved it, and, and <coughs> she found herself in the company of writers. And as soon as possible, she got her girls to come because she's so afraid. They were living with her sister. They were living with her sister. So she got them out, and then she immediately uh, made plans. She filed for divorce with her husband, from whom she was estranged. 
So living in uh, Iowa, this is when she started to write Mulberry and Peach. And oh, that's a little note to myself. In 1967, <laughs> she convinced <coughs> Paul, uh, Paul Engel to create a new program for, for, for foreign writers. And so they, they did this. And uh, she, you know, she's a very determined person. What do they say about these Wuhan people? The Jiu right? They really, they get the job done. <laughs> what is it? What is it? <laughs> this is the Chinese editor of our book. I'd like to introduce Ling Dong. <laughs> so, she's my, my advisor on all matters Chinese. So um, the program began, and, and the international writing program has existed now for 50 years. And they have, I don't know, 4,000 writers have gone into that program. It's the leading residence in the world for international writers. And um, so at this time, she was bringing, uh, the first year, 1967, they brought artists from all over the world. But their emphasis was always on dissidents who, who were censored or who were persecuted. So those were the ones that they first brought, mainly from the Eastern Bloc in, in 1972. And they couldn't bring artists from China at that time. So um, after four years of uh, the program, she and Paul Engel were married and uh, became a family with her daughters. And then in 1972, when there was news of, of Nixon going to China, uh, her husband asked her, tell me more about Mao Zedong. And she said, well, of many things, he was a poet. <laughs> so Paul Engel was a poet and decided he really wanted to learn about Mao Zedong as a poet. So working together is called tandem translation. Uh, they translated, they did the first English translation uh, of, of Mao's poetry. It's uh, 41 poems. It's just incredible, which he wrote during battles. And I mean, at night after a battle, he would write these poems. And um, then the long march, and it's pretty fascinating. But the most important thing is the notes, which she includes the context so you understand what is happening. So um, this won her a lot of enemies especially in Taiwan, where people were saying, why, you know, your father was killed by the communists, which was an, another important detail. And um, so everyone was, uh, friends in Taiwan were against her, and she continued to lose her possibilities of going back. Uh, and so she was banned, actually, until 1988. Now, in 1978, she was able to make her first trip to China since she left in 49. So what she wanted to do more than anything was to meet in addition to her family who was there, to meet the writers who had been persecuted during that time, and she wanted to get them to Iowa. So she was with great difficulty in 1978. She was able to see writers who were kind of, they made it quite difficult for her to do that. But, so she met uh, Ding Ling and Ai Ching, who had been very severely persecuted during the Cultural Revolution. Ai Ching you know, is, is the most famous poet of China, and also the father of Ai Weiwei. And so, as I say, the, the fruit doesn't fall very far from the tree because he was put in jail, I think, when he was like 20 in, in a French jail in Shanghai. So he was a real fighter himself. And actually, Ai Ching's name, this is a, taken, a given a name he took for himself. His name is Jiang, which is the same name as Jiang Kai-shek, the same Jiang, right? And so he hated Jiang Kai-shek so much that he just changed his name to Ai Ching. So this is a name he gave himself. So she wanted them to come to... Um, to Iowa, and, uh, and she made it happen. So they started coming, and from that time, Chinese writers were always part of the international writing program. This is Ding Ling, who came in 1984 and met Susan Sontag and the poet W.S. Merwin. And uh, many writers came, all the leading writers, Wang uh, Yi, um, until today. So this continues. And so Niao Hua Ling is really considered to have had a very important impact on the development of, of modern Chinese literature by bringing these writers here where they could um, meet with writers from around the world. And um, actually, I, it was here in Iowa uh, the first time that Wang Yi's work was read by a person from Taiwan. And uh, this is, everyone knows Mo Yan, who is the, for, for the uh, Nobel Prize for Literature. Chen Ningzhen is a very important dissident writer in Taiwan who passed away last year. But he's actually from Taiwan, a leftist writer, very interesting, very different um, perspective. And he was in and out of jail all the time. Uh, they finally got him to come in 1983. And this was the first time that he had met any writers from China. And he took, he took uh, writings from Wang Anyi and brought them back to Taiwan and had them published in Taiwan for the first time. So this kind of interchange was, was really very, very important. So 
Nia Ling, um, I'll skip ahead so we can do someone else too. But Nia Hua Ling, throughout this time, she was not able to go back to Taiwan because she was blacklisted and she kept doing things like writing the poetry of Mao Zedong. So she couldn't get in at all. In 1987, martial law was lifted in Taiwan, but she, even then they wouldn't let her in. 1988, Jiang, uh, Jiang, Jiang Jingguo passed away and then she could go. So she and her husband went to Taiwan and filled out all these procedures to get de-blacklisted. So she got off the blacklist, which was a very important thing to do but f still had a great sense of resentment for the kind of suffering she had gone through in her own home. So um, skipping through many things that happened, a happy ending to the story. In 2009, she was invited to Taiwan for a, a conference in memory of uh, Lei Zhen of China, uh, <laughs> Zhongguo, and other, and uh, Yin Hai Guang, who was the other. And much to their surprise, at the conference, the President Ma ying showed up and gave a speech as an apology an official apology on behalf of the nationalist government, the Kuomintang, for the people who suffered in this journal, specifically in this journal, and to her as well. So an official apology, and the next day they gave her a medal of the brilliant star, and so it was a very important kind of closure to the suffering that she had uh, had in Taiwan. So she continues to live in Iowa City. Her husband passed away in 91. But she's still a star, and all the Chinese writers come to see her and consider her to be the living history, uh, who is very much treasured uh, among writers in China. So I went to Iowa City to visit her twice, and she's just an incredible character, and more energy than I have, and um, uh, living at the top of a very steep hill, but uh, doing very well. So, Niang uh, Ling. Next, I would like to introduce someone from a person from each of the different places. So another one from Taiwan. Uh, I'd like to introduce a very different type of culture in Taiwan that um, I knew very little about when I lived there. So in those days, the people, the, the aborigines were called Shan Di Ren, if you all remember, and people of Ali Shan Di Gu, you know, all this. But after 1987, there was a big change, and we don't call them Shan Di Ren now, which is very, because first of all, not, they don't all live in the mountains, and um, so they're called Yuan Zhu Min. And, uh, but when I lived there, it was, what they did was like very exoticized uh, tourist entertainment, um, which started under the, the, the Japanese era. So uh, this is, her name is pronounced, if you see the Chinese, Pi Su Wei Xing Yo, but we call her Pi Sui, and uh, that's the, the Chinese given to her. She is really the leading contemporary indigenous artist in uh, Taiwan today. She, uh, she works in, in uh, multimedia dance theater. Her background is in dance, and uh, she's a very important um, uh, aboriginal rights worker who is um, also active as a teacher. So um, let me just tell you a little bit about the, uh, the, the tribes of Taiwan. Bisue comes from the Atayo tribe. I don't know if anyone saw the movie War Warriors of the Rainbow. Um, it's worth seeing, but it's about the Atayo tribe <coughs> and um, a rebellion. It's a very violent movie, but it tells you what happened under the Japanese. Uh, there are 14, sometimes they say 16 tribes. People fight to be recognized because I think you get some kind of a, a, a beneficial uh, status for financial reasons. So, but I understand there's 14, and they make up now 500,000, two percent of the population of Taiwan. Um, they are of an Austronesian background. They're not Han people, and their linguistic footprint leads to um, the Philippines and Malaysia and Haiti. Uh, not sorry, not Haiti. Um, Tahiti and Hawaii. So it's uh, they've been living there for 6,000 years. Uh, whereas the people from China came in the 15th century from, from Fujian, the Han people. Uh, I'm just referring 1930, the Wuxia incident. Remember that Taiwan was a colony of the Japanese for 50 years after 1896. So when, when, the, um, when the Japanese took over, the Japanese are very disciplined and structured people, uh, the, the tribes were um, forced to go to assimilation schools where they had to learn Japanese, as did everyone. Japanese was taught in all the schools. No Chinese was taught in Taiwan at the time. So uh, they had to learn Japanese. And then the, the, uh, the tattoos, which men and women wore, which are a sign of bravery, and also a symbol of, uh, a symbol of recognition in the afterlife. So when you go to the afterlife, your tribe members will all recognize you. So it's a very important symbol. 
but uh, the Japanese put an end to the tattoos and um, put them in assimilation schools and were more or less taught that their own cultures were barbaric and that they would have to become uh, Japanese, which actually by the 1930s, Taiwanese people had become pretty Japanese. I think that Taiwan is the only place in Asia where you don't hear the same kind of uh, remarks about the Japanese. So this is what her, her mother was born in 1902 uh, and under the Japanese, and so she had to adjust to that period. She stayed in the village. And um, her grandmother spoke the dialect, and, but the family had to move. So um, one thing, in 1930 what happened was there was an uprising, 600 of them were killed by the Japanese and a lot of Japanese died. But their hunting ground was taken away and given to another tribe. So they had no livelihood and, and they had to move down into the cities and work in factories. And so the old ladies were left alone and then all the families left to go and find work in the cities. So this is what, uh, this is Bisoy singing actually a song about her grandmother. This is the major work which she has created. This is her signature piece. It's called Silent Innermost. And when her grandmother died in 2009, uh, she was just distraught and realized how much she had lost of the, the legacy, the culture of the, of the people. So she got a grant and spent a year in the, in the mountains, in the, in the village, and they are from the mountains, um, uh, living with five women from the same generation and hearing their stories about what they had actually suffered. And um, so she created a multimedia dance piece and the major song which she sings uh, in this, oops, whoop, what have I? The major song which she, sh she sings is something she wrote called Yearning because this represents the old women in the village who are just yearning always, waiting for someone to come back and visit them because they're all alone, everyone has left. So um, this is another scene from the, um, from the dance theater piece uh, wherein lovers are uh, parting because the, um, the boyfriend has been recruited by the Japanese. So remember in Taiwan, in uh, World War II, the Taiwanese fought on the side of the Japanese. And um, so the Aborigines, the indigenous people also were recruited to fight. And because they were so adept at um, working in the jungle and, and in that kind of environment, they were sent mostly to tropical areas like the Philippines and Malaysia, and most of them never came back. And the ones who did came back, come back were then treated as defeated enemy because when the Chinese army came, that's how they, they saw the Taiwanese people who they fought. They were the enemy. So it was a very difficult period. But what's interesting about this piece is that um, Bisue, which I didn't add, also studied flamenco in Spain for several <laughs> years. <laughs> and uh, she felt there was a very deep connection between flamenco and, and, the, and the, the performance of her people because of the spiritual passion that was expressed. So in this scene, they are uh, saying goodbye. And in that very kind of stoic <coughs> style of not showing any emotion, which really breaks your heart, completely stoic and saying these words of, of uh, these parting words. And then she, in the meantime, is on the stage, on the side, to the back, and she's dancing flamenco. So it's almost that through her dance and this passionate, um, agitated dance, she's able to kind of interpret and express the feelings that they're unable to show themselves. So it's a very powerful moment in the piece. And this, is, this was an award-winning show. It's been performed all around the world now. It won the Taishin Award in Taiwan. Shelly, can you do the next two? Quicker? We'd like to be about half hour for questions. Okay. Just to say, uh, now this is the same. Now she works as a teacher um, with young Aborigines, indigenous kids, trying to help them to rediscover their culture. All right, this is Jaffa Lan. This is the Hong Kong representative. Um, she's an artist educated in Hong Kong, though actually she's from Fujian. And so she's an immigrant to Hong Kong. And uh, something that she told me till we did this story, that was something that she hid her whole life because her family was very poor and they were from the mainland. And the mainlanders weren't really treated that well um, in Hong Kong. Once the, the, uh, the idea of the handover was coming, it was a hard time to be a mainlander in Hong Kong. So this is something, she came with her mother, it's another cultural revolution tragedy. Um, and she, she went to Chinese University and she's a sculptress really, who originally worked in wood. This is actually about SARS. It was a four series piece. This is called For Someone Who Wants to Cry. 
and there were three other pieces that went with this. So she worked in wood and recycled materials. And um, she, I think because of her own background, it's kind of, a kind of shame about poverty and marginalized people. She was always interested in uh, presenting people who were not recognized in society and respected. <coughs> So in Bangladesh, this is just an example of a work <coughs> that she did with uh, rickshaw players. She also had portraits of their faces made, and she had a big exhibition, and all their families came. Uh, of most interest is uh, the New York story. When she came to New York in 2007 on a grant, <coughs> she um, had difficulty. It's not easy to be an artist in New York. And so she went into galleries in Chelsea, and no one was interested in her work, and she was very discouraged and went out to eat something and discovered this restaurant that is still here, Dynasty, <coughs> on 32nd Street. And so it's a Fujinese <coughs> restaurant. The Fujinese uh, own about 90% of the restaurants in New York. So, but they call it Sichuan or they call it whatever else. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so she went in and she heard them speaking yes. Fujo dialect, which is her mother's dialect, and, and so she befriended them. And they became the people who were her first friends, really, in New York. So this is a piece. She was then working in fluorescent light at uh, the Urban Glass Center in New York. So she made them a piece of artwork. We cook art here. And then they introduced her to the statue of Lin Zexu down in Chatham Square. I don't know how many people have seen this down in Chatham Square. Good, OK. Uh, Lin Zexu, I think everyone knows, was uh, the official who threw all the opium into the sea and triggered the the uh, opium wars, which resulted in Hong Kong becoming a colony of the British. So Lin Zexu, although he actually, well, that's his story, but he is a, he, <laughs> Lin Zexu is a hero of Fujian. And as Jaffa said, he's the only one we've got. But he is a, <laughs> he's a very important hero because he's the guy who fought the foreigners. And he stood up for them, and he threw their opium into the sea. And so this is a guy who is really uh, someone who they, who they admire for that. So in the year 2000, which was 20 years after the handover of, Thai, of Hong Kong back to China, um, the, the, um, the Fujian Association uh, put together a Lin Zexu Association run by a guy named Edward Wong, and they raised money and they put up a statue of Lin Zexu in Chatham Square. And uh, the interesting story is that when they took Jaffa to see this, um, they explained to her that although now it says Lin Zexu, pioneer in the war against drugs, there had been a sign before which told the story of the Western powers invading China and grabbing all of the land and forcing the Chinese to buy opium. <laughs> so someone was unhappy about that placard and said it was very offensive to the New York people, and it was removed. <laughs> well, that's all you have to tell an artist. <laughs> so she was just enraged that the history of her people was wiped out in what was supposed to be the land of free speech. So uh, what she decided to do was to, to canonize her hero. And uh, so she organized with the restaurants in this area who provided her with electricity to install a halo over uh, uh, Lin Zexu and make him Saint, Saint Lin Zexu. <laughs> Actually, it also means a moon which comes from the, the famous homesick poem of the, the moon, what is it, Tri <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so it's also about my homeland. Um, so this only could go up for 10 minutes. This is what installation art is, it's performance art, because they would get arrested. So the main thing is to have the photo of this. And um, so this was her great uh, triumph in New York. And when I just went down there two weeks ago just to check what it really said. And when I was there, there was a tour group. I couldn't believe there was a tour group and a New York tour guide taking these people from Finland or someplace. I don't know where they were. And he said to them, uh, yes, this man is the Nancy Reagan of China. <laughs> oh my God. No, that was lucky. I just thought it was so, Did you um, correct them? <laughs> I have a diplomatic background. <laughs> so let's see. So then we'll move on to uh, the last one quickly. Is uh, Wen Qing Lan from Macau. She's a very important composer who, in contemporary music, is very well known. And um, she's someone you should look out for when her work is uh, is performed in the United States. Um, she's from Macau, born in Macau, and uh, grew up, uh, went to school in Hong Kong and then came to the United States where she studied with the leading uh, teachers of contemporary music. So um, just to give a sense of 
uh, Macau is a very different situation from, and this is a picture everyone knows of St. Paul, uh, the facade. But Macau, remember, it was a, 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 colony of the, a colony of the Portuguese for 400 years. I mean, that's incredible. 440 years it was under the Portuguese and right next to China. So, um, but, but uh, the, the Chinese were very separate from the Portuguese. And so, Wen uh, Qinglan doesn't speak Portuguese. She went to Chinese schools because the government paid only for Portuguese people, and that language and Portuguese. So um, it's a very, and actually she went to a leftist school at the time. So uh, in Macau also, there was a lot of freedom about uh, how you educated your children. So during the Cultural Revolution, she had no classes, as, as in China. So um, she went to the, she came to the United States and went to University of California, San Diego, and just studied with these incredible people who are the leaders in contemporary music. Pauline Oliveras, who is uh, known for deep listening, and she passed away last year. But there's a whole group of them. So she began composing, and uh, based on this kind of Western idea of contemporary music. And after she got her PhD, she came to New York and met Zhou Wenzhong, who I think many people here know. <laughs> so Zhou Wenzhong was a whole new experience for her, because he was, here she was studying like music of John Cage, and. So, um, which actually has an Eastern connection. But Zhou Enzhong had, uh, if anyone knows Zhou Enzhong, he ha he's always on the war path. And he had a mission to really introduce the whole idea of an Asian voice in contemporary music. And he was the first to do that. And he's a, he studied with Verez, and as I understood it, it was Verez who talked him into that as a young composer. That what you should be doing is, is digging back into your own culture. So he uh, worked with, so Lung Bunqing worked with him and started to move in a whole other direction. And as a child, she'd studied Chinese poetry and calligraphy. So she still had this background to, to rely upon. So after composing a lot of work, she moved into a new direction. And then here's just an example of one of her works. I think everyone knows the story of Tsai Wenji, who was the Han Dynasty. Uh, she was a musician and a poet and the daughter of a statesman. But she was abducted by some tribe. I can't, I can't remember. She was abducted and taken to a tribe out in the West, and she married the tribal leader and had, and had two children and, and just and was out there for many years. And this is a very important st story in Chinese literature, which appears in plays and in, in poetry and movies. It's it's very important story. It's Hai Wenjin. So she uh, Lung Qing took this and made it into a contemporary opera, and this is. The, the main thing about the story is that Tsai Wenji is allowed to go home. And now she has these two children. And she actually loves her husband. But now she's allowed to go home. And should she leave her children? So it, it's, it's the great moment of, uh, of decision. So Lang Wenqing, um, she explains it was so difficult to do this so that you would have Western and Chinese influence. And the, the, the main the, uh, the challenge is to dissolve the boundaries. So you don't just pick out, oh, this is this, Chinese and Western. But it was considered to be a great success. And oh, sorry. And he actually, he sang in English, and she sang in Chinese. Mm -hmm. And it was at the, I saw it at the Asia Society. It's just a beautiful piece, mm -hmm. which, um, which is still being performed. That this is interesting to me, because many artists, when they start to study art, they often go into the direction of modern art, Western art, and they move away from their own roots. But they often come back, and it's a very common circle that artists come back to their roots, and later in life they want to, they want to do something that's about their own culture. So she grew up in, in uh, Macau, and her most recent piece um, is based on the poetry of this gentleman, Jose dos Santos Ferreira, I don't know how to say it, but he's a beloved uh, poet of Macau who uh, wrote in Macanese. Uh, it's called Patois, which is a language, uh, the Macanese are, are a mixture of Portuguese people and, and Chinese, actually Tanka, and then some Han. But, so they speak a kind of Creole Portuguese language. So he is a beloved local person who wrote um, poetry and plays. And so she created a, a piece uh, for orchestra and chorus using his text, which was sung in Patois. So this is her most recent work, which I think uh, represents uh, the, the circle of, of many artists who come out into the world. So I just want to end with, uh, with one little corny thing. Oh, we're not going to do her? Oh, quickly, you want me to do her? No, no. Okay. Someone can ask about her if you're really interested. But we really do want to give people some time to filmmaker. Yeah, you know. Okay, done. I just wanted you to see. Film has been women have Chinese women have been making films since since 1917, mm -hmm. and uh, it was actually Chinese American 
film women who started, uh, who were the first women to make film. But I thought it was such a great picture. It's a great way to end. <laughs> either about the process or more you want to know about one of the people that Shelley's spoken about or more you want to know about people she hasn't spoken about. Yes. I'm Phil Armbruster, retired journalist. Great talk. So who was Tong Lina? Tong Lina is, uh, is a very hot filmmaker right now. Most of her work has never been shown in China, which is usually the case because there, there are different problems. Um, I'll just tell you her first work, she actually started out as an actress for the People's Liberation Army troop in Shenyang. And she was very unhappy as an actress because it was so phony and all this makeup and the whole thing was, was not authentic at all. So she saw these, you can say old men in China, these old people, you can say that, who lived right outside her house and got together every day and um, just sat around and talked and about different things. And she thought they were so beautiful as com and so natural as compared to this phony makeup and costumes she had to wear that she became a filmmaker. And she filmed them with, a, with just a, a video, um, what is that called, DV camera? Digital video camera, just a small camera. She'd never done this. So she filmed them for, for three years and came up with a, a, a film which has been very successful all around and, the world. And is she living in China? Or? She's in China now. And now she travels a lot because her, mer her most recent film is, is uh, this is a feature film, and it's uh, this is the only feminist film. She's kind of, she's starting to go into that direction because of her own personal problems uh, with her husband, actually, who, who got custody of the child. This kind of thing. So this is the this cannot be shown in China because of the sexual content, but also because uh, one of the leading characters is a ghost who appears to her during the night, and so in China you're not allowed to have ghosts. So, no ghosts. So, of course, she went to the place where people love ghosts, which is Hong Kong. So she produced it. Hong Kong has probably more ghost movies than any movies. So it was pr produced in Hong Kong. So this is her most recent work. And um, this is a work that she did about her parents' divorce. And her parents agreed to do this kind of reality TV uh, to actually talk about their divorce and their family problems and violence. and. It's quite incredible. It's incredible they agreed to do it. But um, this was, of course, criticized in China because it's hanging out your dirty laundry. But many people loved it because it was such an important and such an accurate representation. Of so it was shown in China? Uh, yes, it must have been, yes. Well, but underground. Uh, probably underground, yes. I don't remember. This is not my article. I don't remember. But uh, it was really revolutionary. That, and, and the parents were so cooperative. I, I found it quite amazing. Uh, and they were being filmed. So, yes. Michelle, can I ask you about the... Um, the Mark, introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Mark Sheldon. I'm from Chinese University of Hong Kong. Was Ni Michelle's neighbor for many years. Um, I'd like to ask you about the, the process <laughs> of interviewing what are very unique, even eccentric people. Um, what is the strategy, I mean, to get them to tell you all these things and to talk? I mean, part of it's the solidarity of women, but there must be other skills and other approaches that you had to take to approach folks who are probably naturally quite weary and, and, and worried about being interviewed? Well, they weren't worried at all. I, would, I just, what I, what I did with those, and this is in different languages, in Hong Kong it's all in English, which is so easy. And then in China, it, I, it was in Mandarin, right. which is better, because people are much better in their own language, and they, can, they really can, can express things that are not there in, in their second language. But I found that they were so into this that what turned out to be the best strategy is that I would just say to them, all right, we're gonna start with when you were born and who were your parents and then we'll take it from there. And then I just let them talk. And I found when I asked questions in order to clarify something, I sort of broke the momentum. And they were a little irritated <laughs> because they were moving, it was like they, there were times when they went into another dimension where they would remember things that they hadn't remembered. Because no one, who, no one does this. You don't talk about your life from the day you're. None of us do that, and so. And, and, right now. and it's a very, it's a very uh, deep experience, and it's very spiritual because all these things are evoked that start to come out. And so it was not difficult. I don't tape because I'm just phobic. I can't do. 
it ruins everything if I'm worried. So I just take any unbelievable notes and type them up immediately. I know what I want and I don't want. Mm -hmm. So you didn't, you didn't video them and you didn't even tape record. I would tape record, but I would tell myself I'm never gonna listen to it so that I knew it was there. But I was so nervous that I would make a mistake, I didn't want to rely on it. <laughs> and I read it, Studs Terkel did the same thing because he was also afraid. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, and then what we did, I, I have to say, each of these articles, I allowed them to read, which is not what journalists are supposed to do at all. But I was very afraid, I didn't want anyone to get in trouble. And as I said, they told me these things that were not discreet. And, and so, I mean, some of it I just didn't want to include, which I became the censor. But it makes you realize that there's, you, you use 10% at most of the whole thing. So you're making decisions all, all the time. You're making decisions. But uh, I let them read it. Some of them we had to translate back into Chinese. He did some of that. I had to translate into Chinese. And then it's not exactly right either because um, you know, it's just difficult to, to translate nuances. So, but um, they were, no one ever asked to change anything except maybe my brother's name was this and not that. And so, but for the most part, nobody, they, they weren't worried about anything. So I'm worried because I, everything's in there. <laughs> well, it's a testament to you too and your writers editors, or you as the editor, that that was the case. That's well, quite I think amazing. It's also because the Asian Cultural Council is like a family. When you have that connection, it's this, they know, so they just trust you, and then they trust me too. Yeah. Yeah. The trust is the... The trust is... Yeah, it's really essential that yes. you got the interview and they trust you, that you bring, you know, the authentic one. And they knew I would let them see it. Yeah. yeah. They knew I would let them see it, and then and those gave me the translator. And so. how about maneuvering in the, the different jurisdictions? Were there issues that came up between the artists from these different four different places? Uh, I'm not sure I know. Well, amongst between one another, you mean like in the in the well, one of the one of the artists in Taiwan wanted to make sure that it was Taiwan, because this was a, a very important political issue. And fortunately, because this was kind of my orientation anyway, because I really believe, as I said, that culture is not about what kind of passport you have. Culture is about your parents, and it's about your language and what you eat. That's what culture is. And so um, I think this is a much more accurate uh, portrayal. But what I really want, wanted to do was to show the diversity of the area and complexity within cultures. Because I think in, in this country we hear a lot of generalization. We hear like the Muslim community, when there are 74 sects of Muslims. And so I think it's, it's time to, for people to have a little more uh, understanding of the complexity. Even we, none of us can learn everything, but at least you can tell yourself, well, I really don't know anything about this. <laughs> and start with that. Start with a kind of humble point of view that I'm sure this is much more complex than I know myself. Yes, Kim. Ken Barbash, Barbash Arts Consulting. Did, um, of the contemporaries, the people still active now, is what kind of a um, community, do, do they know each other? Do they speak to each other? Do they collaborate? Is there any sense of a uh, they did not, community? They, they, these people didn't know one another. And I was most amazed in Hong Kong, which is so tiny, that the four in the different art fields had never met before. Mm -hmm. I found yeah, that really, really amazing. The playwright, and then the one with Linda Xu, and then there's another, Hong Ji Fung's wife, and, um, and, and then, then and they didn't know each other. Yeah. Wow. And I, I had a meeting of all of them after the, when, when the book was coming out, and I realized this is a really tight and cold meeting. I didn't know what's going on. I realized they didn't know each other. And I had just mm -hmm. assumed that because they're very well known artists. And in terms of the furthering of their career, did you find that um, there were other women that helped them? You know, was there a community of sort of producers? That help the women, mm -hmm. help the you know, help these women that mentored them, or that is that somehow helped them on their way. Yes, to succeed. Yes, I think that there was, and in um, in the case of Wen Hui, actually, the, she was a, the, a choreographer who came to the United States in modern dance, and I tried to introduce these people. Actually, her mentors were Americans here. Mm -hmm. Oh, were they women? Because that's your they question. Were women. They were yes. women. Yeah, they were women. Mm -hmm. And was that mostly the case that people who helped them? Oh, clearly it was Nat Wanling. Paul Engel was a male, but did you find, is there a common thread that the mentors of women were men? Or I think it's your teacher. It's usually your teacher who is the person who is your mentor. 
And I mean, there's some women who really do help women. And I don't know that, that they don't have this, it's quite new in China, the whole sense of, 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 of women. I mean, feminism is a word everyone's terrified of here, too. I, mean, I don't think people realize what it means. It's just about equality, but it's taken on a whole other connotation. And, um, and, and there's a fear of being identified as, as such because then you can't get married or what, you know, there's a lot of, and then it's also political, depending on the translation of the word. But um, some are certain, now Wen Hui is the one who is starting to do that. Yang Lina, the filmmaker, is starting to do that because they have a new consciousness about it. But I think in places where the first question, the first problem is human rights, the issue of women's rights becomes secondary. And so in, in places like Hong Kong, too, um, it's a colony. So I think women's rights has emerged more slowly than in the United States. So you're saying that this generation now is mentoring younger women? There are cases right? of that. I can't say that it's a movement, but there are cases of that. Mm -hmm. John. Uh, John Lowitz from the National Committee. So you, start, you started off your talk, which was excellent, thank you. Uh, saying that none of these women, they weren't on Wikipedia, they, 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 they weren't uh, there wasn't much written about them in English. So at the completion of the project, is there an explanation of why? Is there some, um, I don't know, are there are any, any broad insights for why haven't, why don't they promote themselves and why have others not promoted them? I think it's a problem of women don't promote themselves as well. I mean, it's a whole meaning thing, right? And um, I think that does exist. And then you have the Chinese problem of being humble and not, you know, which Facebook is helping to change that. So I think that will, will be different. But I think just historically, um, it has been hard for women and that they have not been recognized as equal to the men, especially in areas like traditional painting and calligraphy is really uh, difficult for women. So I think uh, they're working um, against some, some resistance. I mean, there are areas like dance that are easier, but um, I think they also don't go out and push and, and, and make art, make works that are gonna sell that they can see it sort of strategically. They don't think that way. Strategically, they just do something that they want to do. And, and I think men can be more strategic that way. Is this, has this book changed anything for them by pointing out the advantages of publicity? Is there a It's just come out. And for to them, to be presented in English is just amazing. Um, what they're going to do with that, we will see. But, but I think social media is also changing that. Because now with WeChat in China, people are posting all kinds of things about themselves. And I think it will change the, uh, the whole mentality. And I hope that the, the single child era, that those are people who will feel more uh, able to promote themselves because they're not like in the past you're number two, three, and four and you have like a different sense of, of hierarchy. So I don't know if that's true, but I think that, that I can see where it might be the case. Paula. And Joe, you mentioned that some of them Paula, you introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Paula Rouse with the Star Foundation. Um, some of them have been able to present to you or where they have come to the United States, but what is the most These were all of these, all of these women, what I worked with was the, the, the database, the pool of Asian Cultural Council recipients. Okay. Oh, because they're 5,000 people all together over 50 years. And, and so I, I wanted them all to have the international experience. I thought that would make them, well, that's another commonality. And I think they would be very different from the people who don't have that perspective. And as I was saying, sense of identity, which you get when you go abroad identity starts with deciding what you are not. And so that's often uh, a very important result of having your first experience abroad. So they've all been to the US? They've all been to the, actually one of them, Lam Wen Ching, when she received her grant, it was to go to Japan because she wanted to do research on Tang Dynasty poetry. Mm -hmm. And this is something which I didn't know that actually Japan is the place to go if you want to learn about Tang <coughs> Dynasty art forms and music because it's been preserved there. Um, during the Tang Dynasty, they sent a whole um, set of musicians uh, in, to Kyoto where there's a replica of a, of a, of a temple from, from the capital of Chang'an. And, and the Japanese have preserved it. Um, they have a Gagaku orchestra, which is like the Tang Dynasty. They still wear the hats and it doesn't exist in China. 
So somehow the Japanese preserved uh, and respected the Chinese art forms in a way that they just they didn't continue in China. So she went to study that in Japan. Yes. <coughs> Margot Landman with the National Committee. Wonderful book. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Um, I have two questions. One is, how did you come to choose these particular women with your database of 5,000? Of course, some of those are men, but and presumably Asian, more than Asian. 16 of them are women. And who is the intended audience for the book? Do you see it as a textbook or what? Well, it's very much a general audience. It's not at all academic. And I wanted it to be very accessible because, because I was aware of the fact that people didn't know about them. And I think scholars, if they wanted to know, they could, uh, they'd have a way to find out. But I thought, too, it was a way of introducing uh, these cultures to a general audience in a way that they might be able to, to read as sort of like magazine articles. So the idea was mm -hmm. definitely general audience English speakers. Uh, whether or not textbook, um, I wasn't really thinking that way. Uh, in, in terms of picking the 16 women, I was trying, I was, I had the four places, I had the art forms and the chronological line. And then actually deciding, a lot of it had to do with what I knew about them, whether they, whether they would talk, whether they had stories that I knew would be very good in, 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 uh, for an American audience. And um, just, I mean, for example, Jaffa Lan is a very important artist, but I knew the Linz issue story would be good because it's in New York. And so I did take some of these things into consideration because uh, the hardest thing actually was deciding because there's so many great artists. Did anybody turn you down? There's so many great artists. Well, that's good because you can have the second book. Well, that's what they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I probably lost some friends. I mean, that's what, what happens. But um, no, it was very difficult not being able to include more. There are a lot of people who uh, could have been included, who deserve to be included, but um, you just cannot have them all. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Monica from Oh, hi. Um, I have a question. Do you also want to have the book published in the China, greater China area? So um, even in Chinese, I know you have a Chinese editor. So is it going to be published in that area? Or is it you know, intended for an American speaking audience? Well, it was intended for an American English speaking audience. But there's more interest from Chinese people than I expected. I mean, I thought that maybe for them it was a little dumbed down or too much stories of, you know, things about political history. But I think because it's so broad, all these different art forms, that, that many Chinese people are finding it um, very interesting, more than, than I, th very eye-opening, which I didn't really expect. It sure was for me. But there is a, there's a, um, there's a publisher in Taiwan who is interested in translating and nothing has been decided, and, and uh, so we're thinking about that. What do you think? I think I love it. Most of the artists, I, I don't know, like the ones who just introduced. I so do you think for a Chinese audience it would be of interest? I think so, yeah. I think so, too. <coughs> especially to share the various like, history that's there but not shared from different places between the mainland or Hong Kong or mm -hmm. Taiwan. A lot of things can be told from the stories from individual artists. And I think everyone in the area will be interested. Thank you. That's very encouraging. <laughs> Right now, we can't even get the book into China. I mean, we can't even mail it in, in English form. So uh, why? why? It's very hard to mail books into China because of censorship. I don't know that this in particular, I think it's any books. It's uh, very difficult, so. Um, but it hasn't uh, been banned. Well, of course, it's just out to you. I hope it gets banned that everybody will buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want us to cut that out? <laughs> Actually, it's okay. I bought a book from the Metropolitan Museum, and then they mailed to me, but it take, took longer. So maybe they had an arrangement or something. The publishers in Hong Kong, which maybe is the problem, because there have been some problems with publishers <laughs> yes. in Hong Kong. So, <laughs> uh, so that could be the, I, I don't know. And you might have to change the title a little bit from mainland China, Hong yeah. Kong. Macau and Taiwan, I think one of my friends yeah. gave that suggestion. It, it really has Say mainland China. Yes. Because this implies that like not there's not something else. Country. Right. If, it's, if you're talking about political. Yes. Right. And, the, and there is a huge consciousness. Oh, I'm sure. Yes. 
I'm sure there is. But uh, yeah, but that's kind of the but point. But your editors, that's the point. Do. But that's also <laughs> the point, right? <laughs> I found it fascinating that none of the four in Hong Kong knew each other, especially as you say, Hong Kong is so small. Did you find that? Or, or you I was very surprised. I was very surprised. Do you think the same would be true for male artists from the different genres? More or is so. it just that it's so? Probably more. Well, these are different fields. <coughs> right. That's and I think that is something in Hong Kong society where it's still kind of boxed in. Although people do multimedia work, I think that you kind of stick to your field. And one of the reasons I remember the Asian Cultural Council, they love these parties because you meet different people who are not in your field. So somehow these four have not. But I, I think that's, you can make a generalization about Hong Kong. You don't really step out of your field, and maybe there are not activities, or but uh, they had all heard of one another. They had never met. They just met. They had a group. Well, you should. Your publisher should do a party where you can invite all of them. Oh, good right. idea. Four different <laughs> areas, <laughs> which would be yeah, I think fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I bet UCCA would carry the book. You have to carry it in, too. Though, What's so. UCCA? The Yule Center. Oh, oh, Center. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, we can. Well, that be that, an yeah. And also, uh, which is called and go through them that you can, you know. Well, I, I also, I don't know if there are any content problems. Yeah, I don't think so. And also your approach is different. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, Guan say that, uh, you know, we'll be, we'll be interested by Chinese or Chinese so readers. And no matter what, it's, I mean, it, one could get it. It's not as though you could Yeah, but the, 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 at problem. the end of the day, the Chinese version were, 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 were really the important sure. for that market. Yeah. Yes. Michelle, you said that um, feminism is frowned on. Uh, is, is that true in Taiwan as well? Uh, I didn't ask people there. I mean, they've had a whole feminist movement since the 1970s. Right, I know. So, but how, but those artists, those feminist artists in the 80s really suffered and were really criticized. But what I'm talking about is a, is a very uh, a recent, but see, I lived abroad for 30 years, and so I'm kind of a Rip Van Winkle. And, and when, <laughs> when I came back, there are a lot of things that are different. And so I, I say a lot of things that shock people. But, <laughs> but I was very surprised in this country that of the kind of response that I got about writing a book about women. I mean, people would say things like, oh, you're a feminist, in not a positive way. <laughs> and um, you know, they ask you, are you married? Which is, it's a question about your gender preference. So it was really amazing to me that that was the case. But I, there was a little pushback. Um, in, in China, it, it's different um, because feminism, you know, I, I think you've heard the three genders in, in China, male, female, and female PhD. <laughs> no, I have not heard. <laughs> I have yeah. Yeah. So it's very hard to get married if you have a PhD, and if you're a feminist, forget it. So it's not something, it's not a label that you want, but it, it also, it just has the wrong meaning. It has this very heavy meaning of a man-hater, and, and then one of the translations is, is, is Nu Quan, which sounds like human rights, so that's another problem. And, um, Someone said something very interesting to me. Another problem is that because of Jiang Qing, Jiang Qing was such a strong woman, mm. such a strong woman is that she became a very bad role model for the strong woman. Yeah. And that people really, uh, that affected how people Yes, but the current president's that. wife is a wonderful role model, seeing someone that is a feminist, but, but you know. Who sees her a as a feminist? She's, she's a feminist. She's someone who has, she's the Jackie Kennedy of China, yeah, yeah, and so yeah. as a female role model, she counters the Jiang Qing wife of the a same. leader as a role model. But she's not the president, she's a leader. No, she's not the president. Yes. Neither was Jiang Qing. And she had to leave her so. career so when he her started Jackie. rising. Yeah. I don't yeah. think yeah, that's I a know. great analogy. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I, yeah, I think that uh, Peng Yuan was very admired by a lot of uh, ordinary Chinese women. And yes, it's, you know, so uh, her dress, you know, people are copying or whatever. But, you know, China big, there are a group of people, but also there are young people is born in 80, late 80s, 90s, and 20s. Then those women really care about nothing. <laughs> they, they, they just do live broadcasting, social media, 24 hours, 
you know, they're doing all sorts of things. So well, they care about career and making money. That's yeah. Okay. yeah but, but, but <laughs> that's no, something no, to care about. But, but, but <laughs> yeah, that, that's a kind of new situation. So I don't know what it's fallen to the feminism or not. It's, it's a new, new dynamic. Yeah, that I'm not sure. But of course, feminism in, in 2014, there was a bad moment when the feminist five were arrested because they were protesting about sexual harassment on public yeah. transportation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so they were protesting, I think they had on wedding dresses that were like spattered with blood, this was domestic abuse. So they were put in, in prison for, for a month. And so this was a big outcry. Where, all where was the world. that? This was in Beijing. 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 Yeah. And so I think that was also a, a little frightening <coughs> for people who didn't really want that affiliation or that association with their, with their name. But um, most people in China don't know about it. So it's, uh, I mean, people in the book didn't know about it. Really? Yeah. It wasn't publicized in China. It was in Hong Kong. No, but the, so the Chinese people, <coughs> book it, but what about the Hong Kong? The mainland. Or, they all the know mainland. We all know mainland. about it. Everybody else. It's just the mainland women. Yeah. People in Hong Kong knew about it. Yeah. Are there, is there any one last question? If not, then please join me in thanking Shelley. Thank you.